Hello everyone. We're going to look at the third week for engineering, which will be rocketry, which I would consider engineering's greatest feat. Now you will be doing your own rocketry experiments, so you will need to have the materials on hand in order to make this happen. The first thing I wanted to introduce you to was the very early prototypes of rockets. This, is, this technology is about a thousand years old, if not a little bit older. If you are watching this video, you're going to have to go to this link at the bottom. Um, it's in the module. It's called Chinese Rockets. That's the video where you would be able to access this. I'm not going to play it in this version of my presentation because it will have some issues with the sound, I'm sure. So if you want to see this video, which everything in my presentations is testable material, I would suggest that you go to the Chinese Rockets link in the module, not here on the video screen, but in the module below this presentation. We will be using our rockets in the atmosphere because we can't get above the atmosphere, which means we need to be familiar with different aerospace terms, which are also useful for airplanes. First one is thrust. This is what's going to push our rocket forward. In our case, it will be air. It'll be two different kinds of air that will push our rocket forward. And that is where the um, explosive force comes that pushes the rocket forward. Drag is the push back. When the rocket's trying to go forward, it's going to hit the air. As it goes through the air, the air molecules will push back. This is also called air friction or wind resistance. Very important concept to be familiar with when we're designing our rockets, thrust and drag. Lift, if you end up putting any wings or fins on your rocket, which it might not be a bad idea to do, lift is an upwards force that allows your um, vehicle, in this case a rocket, to move upwards. And that is because of how fins or wings will cut through the air. It's a way of overcoming air resistance by increasing the pressure, the air pressure under the aircraft or the rocket. And then, of course, we have weight, which is the downward pull from gravity that all vehicles are going to face, um, including the bottle rockets that you will be making. This video, again, is a video that I will not play in this presentation, but if you want to see it, you're watching my video right here, you'll go to the How Do Airplanes Fly link in order to watch it. It will be below... <clears throat> excuse me, this presentation in the module. One of the concepts, the main concept to really start thinking about is thrust. That's that push that moves the rockets forward. The original Chinese rockets had gunpowder as their explosive material in order to make the rocket move. In this video, which I will also link at the bottom, you'll see the invention of Robert Goddard. Robert Goddard was the first person to develop a liquid fuel for the rocket, which will be coming um, more necessary as we go on through this presentation. Understand the difference between a solid rocket engine and a liquid rocket engine. We have different kinds of rockets that come in different designs, and oftentimes that's based on the fuel that they use. Most rockets that you're familiar with are chemical rockets. There are nuclear rockets, although nuclear rockets have not been used to launch any vehicles into space. Ion thrusters have been used, and I'll talk about a few experimental designs which you might see um, and we might discuss over the course of this unit. Now, why rockets? Why go to space in general? The International Space Station is a wonderful example of international cooperation. Russia and the United States don't always get along so well, but they do on the space station. There's always one United States astronaut and one Russian astronaut all the time on the space station. In recent years, we've primarily been sending our astronauts to the space station, United States astronauts going on Russian rockets because we have this cooperation agreement. Although now the United States is finally starting to get its own space program going again where it launches its own, robot, uh, launches its own astronauts 
into space. My apologies. I was looking at the next one about robotics. Space allows us to develop new technologies. Many, many of the advances in early computers was thanks to the rocket program, the space program. Lots of robotics is also thanks to that. Lots of things every day, memory from microwave ovens, are also a direct consequence of the United States space program and the investments that the United States has made into space exploration. If we can settle more planets besides the Earth, we have a better chance of survival. If there was some disaster to come to Earth and we had a colony on Mars, well, then humanity has a better chance of survival. If we had a colony on Earth, Mars, and Venus, and yes, Venus colonies are possible, we'll talk about that at some point, and Jupiter, and maybe the moons of Jupiter or the moons of Saturn, now we're really increasing our chances as a species to survive. And if we can move to other star systems, which would be even better, then we're really increasing the chances that humanity will survive for millions or possibly billions of years. There's also a lot of money to be made in space. We can mine asteroids. Asteroids have a lot of the valuable substances on Earth. They have them in greater quantities. They have gold, they have platinum, they have iridium, they have osmium. These are important elements that are very valuable on Earth. Most of what we dig out of the Earth's crust actually comes from asteroids that crashed thousands or millions of years ago. If we can go straight to the asteroids and mine them ourselves, well, then we would be able to make lots and lots of money. It would also answer the question, where life came from? Did life begin on Earth? Did it begin somewhere else? Are we alone in the universe? These are questions that going into space will answer. Some of the deepest questions for humanity can only be answered if we travel and explore space. As I mentioned, there are different kinds of rockets. The most common ones are the chemical rockets. But in every case, chem chemical rockets or nuclear rockets are mainly riding on an explosion. A controlled explosion that comes out the back of the rocket. So as the astronaut Michael P. Anderson said, when you launch in a rocket, you're not really flying that rocket. You're just sort of hanging on. These are enormous explosions that carry the rocket upwards. And depending on the explosive material, material it could be a solid rocket or it could be a liquid rocket. In either case, you're dealing with very explosive material that you only want to come out the back of the rocket. If it comes out anywhere else, then the entire rocket explodes. And that's the main challenge in rocketry, is how to get the explosion to go in the right direction, but not fail, um, and not fail coming out the sides of the top, which would be a major problem. Here, some of you may be familiar with chemistry. Here are some common chemical equations that would explain rockets. I just wanted you to kind of see this since this is a science class technically. I wanted you to see some of the um, science that goes on with rocketry. In this case, we would have liquid hydrogen. If you remember your Hofbrinkel, we have two hydrogens joined together and then my two oxygens, they're both liquid. They're both kept very, very cold inside the rocket. When they combine at the back of the rocket, they explode into water, which releases so much heat that the water comes out as water vapor. Hydrogen and oxygen in this case are reactants and water or water vapor is the product. In this case, Hydrazine, another rocket fuel. If you happen to see the movie The Martian, that's one of the um, rocket fuels mentioned is hydrazine. It's very explosive liquid. Um, that's combined with oxygen inside many rockets, and that would produce nitrogen and water vapor, just like you saw before. Very hot water vapor because this is a strongly exothermic reaction, if you remember your chemistry terminology. The last one would be a solid rocket. This is ammonium nitrate, another very explosive compound. And what that does is undergoes a decomposition reaction where it turns into a gas, releasing seven moles, if you remember this, seven moles of gases for every two moles of ammonium nitrate that is made. If you are familiar with the giant explosion that happened in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, not too long ago, 
uh, that was an ammonium nitrate explosion that leveled a big chunk of the city. So these are very explosive chemicals that we're dealing with, chemical rockets. We also have the nuclear rockets. Now, chemical, rock, chemical explosions are big. Nuclear explosions are way bigger. Um, we haven't actually built a nuclear rocket that would actually travel into space, although we've had the designs for close to 70 years, maybe a little bit longer than that. Freeman Dyson, who recently passed away, he lived in Princeton, um, he was the one who came up with one of the first nuclear rocket designs, which was something similar to this, where a nuclear bomb would come out of the back of the spaceship. The explosion would then push this pusher plate forward, and that would accelerate the spacecraft. That would allow it to carry much heavier payloads. The boom, the ex nuclear explosion, is f far stronger than a chemical explosion. So the nuclear explosion would allow the spacecraft to have more fuel on board, more bang out of that fuel, and it could carry a heavier payload, so a heavier um, passenger section or heavier equipment that it was taking to space, and it could go at a faster speed. This is a technology we've had for 70 years. It does use the atomic bomb as one of the power sources, and it could certainly get spacecraft to Mars very quickly, to Saturn very quickly. Freeman Dyson himself had plans to travel to Saturn and back in about two years on one of these spacecraft. And it could get us, he also calculated it could get us to the nearest star and back in about 150 years. Now that's seems like a very long time and it seems like longer than the lifespan of most people but this this sort of a spacecraft could carry up to a hundred thousand people on it which means you basically have a f space flying city and so the people who left earth their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren or their great-great-grandchildren would come back in in 150 years and that technology would get us to a nearby star system where it is thought actually that there is an Earth-sized planet. The nuclear fuel, the nuclear explosion option can be one of two types. We have nuclear fission. You have a very large atom like uranium that gets split and energy is released in that case. We've used nuclear fission technology for nuclear power plants, for nuclear bombs. We've used it for many things for many years, ever since 1945, when the very first nuclear explosion was detonated in um, Trinity in New Mexico and then was used in war um, against Japan in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nuclear fusion is almost as old. It was about 1949 that the first fusion bomb was detonated. We don't control fusion explosions yet. We can control fission reactions pretty easily. Right across the road, fruit run, Route 1 from Princeton, is the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, where they're working on sustainable nuclear fusion reactions, which would take hydrogen two different types of hydrogen and smush them together in order to make helium and release energy. This is a much cleaner fuel source than the fission reaction. The fission reaction makes radioactive byproducts. The fusion reaction makes helium. So it would not um, be nearly as dangerous if we could get a sustained and controlled reaction with fusion. The nice thing, other nice thing about fusion is because it uses hydrogen, our fuel is readily available in water on Earth and readily available across the universe because the most common element in the universe is hydrogen. There's one other type of rocket, and I will show the video. Um, I'll link this video also at the um, bottom of this, this presentation. Another type of nuclear rocket doesn't use a nuclear explosion, but uses the heat from thermal rockets from nuclear. Uh, I'm sorry, uses the heat from nuclear reactions to generate a lot of heat on a liquid or a gas that's inside the rocket. When that starts to boil or when that starts to heat up intensely, it's kind of like a, a teapot that whistles. All of that 
very high energy steam or whatever um, molecule or atom that happens to be inside the rocket gets accelerated out at a very high speed. And the more speed you have, the more thrust you're able to make. There, was a, there were plans for nuclear thermal, thermal rockets that were going to take people to Mars by 1980, which would have been pretty amazing. It could take heavier weights of equipment and passengers than the spacecraft that went to the moon, and it would cut travel time in Mar- to Mars about in half, which is great because the challenge with Mars travel is that long distances mean that people are exposed to more radiation during the travel from the Earth to the Moon, I'm sorry, from the Earth to Mars, for example. So the less time that you're traveling, the less time you're exposing yourself to dangerous radiation from the sun. And as I said before, the nuclear pulse propulsion uses nuclear explosions to push a spacecraft forward. Freeman Dyson was one of the scientists who developed this. And there were lots of plans to develop these nuclear pulse rockets. I will link this video as well for you to have the chance to see, because we will be seeing this and talking about this during class. There are other possibilities for space travel. One of them is what we call an ion thruster, which is basically an electric spaceship. It uses electricity to knock electrons off of atoms or molecules to give them a charge. When they get a charge, you can actually use electricity to speed them up. You can make a magnetic field and speed them up and force them out of the back of the spaceship. And when they get forced out of the back of the spaceship, that causes them the spaceship to speed up. Now, unfortunately, this has very low thrust, which means you can't launch it from Earth. Earth's gravity is too strong to uh, successfully launch an ion thruster from Earth. But the advantage is they will run for long times and maintain their acceleration. There was a Dawn mission that went to an asteroid named Ceres that used an ion thruster. The fastest rockets we can build right now are ion thrusters. The only disadvantage is they need to be launched from space. In addition to that, we have other possibilities for spaceship designs. We would have a monopropellant where we have a material like hydrazine. I mentioned that earlier, which instead of combining with oxygen, which would be another propellant for the rocket to work, we have one propellant, we cause it to break down, and these very hot gases traveling very quickly come out of the back of it and cause the rocket to go upwards. That makes the rocket design a little bit less complicated. And if it's a little bit less complicated, there's less chance for failure. So this is a possibility for a safer kind of rocket because as of now rockets fail about two percent of the time which means if you're launching people out of every hundred human launches about two of them go bad now we do have escape mechanisms for rockets nowadays that we didn't have previously but it is still a very dangerous thing to travel into space solar sails are very exciting they can catch sunlight Sunlight will push on the spacecraft. The only challenge is you need really, really big sails in order to catch enough light to accelerate a spacecraft. But these could go 10% the speed of light, which would get us to the nearest star and back possibly within you know less than 100 years' time, which seems like a lot. But if you're sending a probe, a robot probe, and you want to gather information about a nearby star system before you actually sent people there, this would be the way to do it. Now, antimatter is the most amazing of all of the possible rocket fuels because it releases enormous amounts of energy, which could actually get a spaceship 90% the speed of light or faster. That's where we would actually be able to travel extremely long distances through space because as you go to those high speeds, time would slow down for you thanks to Einstein's theory of relativity. Time would slow down for you. So in your lifetime, you could easily travel to other stars or possibly even other galaxies if we were able to travel more than 90% the speed of light. So really, we just need to start thinking about this. We really need to get 
moving on this. As Carl Sagan said, exploration is in our nature. We began as wanderers and we are wanderers still. We have lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic ocean. We are ready at last to set sail for the stars. This is what Carl Sagan said. The challenges you'll be making were, we're not going super big yet, but the challenges you'll be making are, and you will have this in a materials packet, you'll make a rocket from a one liter bottle, which we will launch hopefully by the time we get back to school, which won't be very long from now. Or, and you will also make a pop rocket, which will actually use a chemical reaction to make the rocket travel upwards. So I'm really looking forward to these challenges, and I hope we can move forward with that. But remember, anything that I've mentioned in a presentation or shown you is potentially testable material. So be aware of that and be ready for that. I also want you talking about your rockets and understanding the concepts of thrust and drag and lift and weight or gravity. So please be aware of those and please be able to use those as we go forward. Thank you.